for me, well-being for what it's worth, at its simplest, I would define it as a sense of contentment. But I think it combines your mental health, your physical health, and that feeling of, are, are you in a good place? Is the place you're in, does it make you feel good about being there? And if you're spending eight hours a day in the workplace, well, it's hard to feel contented if your physical or your mental health is poor. It's about usefulness, purpose, and dignity. Um, as, as much as anything and that's the, the bit that I think sometimes is missing. It really is a strategic issue yeah. and the good news I think is more and more companies are doing the strategic issue. Yeah. They're seriously saying strategically how do we look at our line managers, how do we look at flexible working, they look at the full package. We need to look at individuals more holistically and realize that people are all at different stages in terms of well-being and all have different backgrounds and all have different requirements and therein lies one of the one of the contemporary challenges for employers is how do you cater to varying needs across your um, across your employee base when we first set out our well-being program we thought we knew best and we set out what the well-being program would look like and it started to fail and surprise, surprise, when we asked the question, why is it failing, we got the answers that we needed, which was where we should have been asking the questions in the, mm -hmm. in the first instance, mm -hmm. what yeah. should our well-being program yeah, exactly. include? Actually, what matters is how you run your business and whether you run it in a way that empowers people and makes people feel happy at work. Which, which is about leadership and the, the, the board having a direct input into what the health of their workforce is. So instead of talking about workplace accidents, which clearly they still need to do, we should be talking about how healthy is our workforce and what are we doing within the constraints that are available to us to try and improve that. What's that, what's that plan, what's that strategy? We should be measuring what we do. We should be measuring it and that's what we give the board. We give the CFO, the CEO, HR guys and gals, we give them that data and you can do it and it's not complicated. You can but there's a challenge around measuring the, the softer parts of that. Mm. So businesses don't measure well absence but they do measure it, most of them. They don't measure lack of productivity within the workplace. Employers have got a statutory duty of the private sector to actually you know, sort of make a profit. That's what they've got to do, right? So you concentrate on productivity and sickness absence, okay? The reality is that as a lot of companies have found out, it actually is more productive to actually treat your workers disposable. Um, that's how the gig economy actually, um, actually developed. Unfortunately, many organisations that I work with um, have got limited budgets for wellbeing. And I think one of the ways that you can inform your well-being strategy is, is deep data analytics. So look at things like your absence data, if you've got employee benefits and so on. So understand what the underlying health risks are and that is where you target your spending. What I've heard is incentivization of both employer and employee. I'd love to see something coming from the government on how that can work. But that is aspirational and that could take us another 20 years to get anywhere near the percentage of organisations that, that need to do that. Sometimes you, it gets worse before it gets better and people think yeah. oh, what's, what's happening here but you have yeah. to lift the lid on it oh, to get it yeah. to kind of uh, to see what you're dealing with and then and then put your interventions in place. The idea that now the line manager is basically a personnel officer, a welfare officer, a technical officer, a best friend, etc. That, that is nonsense. And rather than actually saying, you know, we need to recruit this kind of person, all line managers have to have this wonderful set of skills. It's because basically the organisations are passing the buck. We've got more people suffering with work-related stress, depression and anxiety today than we did last year. 44% of that um, relates to workload and that's followed by job insecurity and, and change in the organisation. So from a workload perspective, the line manager holds the key. We don't look at that, that primary level of intervention, the mm. job design. You don't get it right in the first mm. place. You have all these other things, but you've got someone collapsing yeah. under the load of a yeah. badly designed <coughs> job because there's too much to do or there's the risk of violence and it's not managed. So I, I do think it helps to go primary, secondary, tertiary on some of this. Yes. I think we need to go back to the fundamentals on how you become a line manager. I, I, yeah. I think we're being disrespectful yes. to, to individuals by and, and lacking in support by putting individuals in managerial positions with, 
without the skill set to do it. To me, the biggest tool for measurement is the whites of the eyes test. Staring at somebody and having a conversation with them on the shop floor saying, what does it feel like for you? Mm. Has the strategy that I got endorsed by the board landed on the shop floor of a, of a delivery office or a mail centre? Do you know how to access the employee assistance programme? Do you know what Because Healthy Minds Matters is about? If you're working in an organisation that, that hasn't created an environment where an individual feels able and comfortable to be open and honest, what you'll get is the nodding dog routine. Yeah, yeah, everything's fine, everything's fine. You can't really determine uh, well-being until you've, you've defined what it is and how you're going to measure. And none of these measuring tools actually do that. So, um, you know, I've, I've, I've seen them. I don't, I don't, I don't agree with you. I, the tools are okay. I think I agree with James. Yeah. Vitality does stuff in this arena. I think the tools are good. Where I think the problem is, and that comes in the, in the trade union sense, mm -hmm. uh, uh, very importantly, is once you get the data, what do you do with it? There's nothing inherently evil or good about technology, it's just how we apply it. It's just how it's managed. It's how it's managed. It's just guidelines is yeah. all we need. The things that really annoy people um, are being expected to reply immediately. Um, and the fact that, you know, with, with, if you sent a letter, you didn't actually expect yeah. them uh, to get a reply within an hour. And often it would be days or, or, or weeks sometimes. I absolutely believe in the flexibility and allowing people to, you know, mm. do their work mm. as and when mm. they, they wanted to fit around their lives. Mm. But if the line manager is sending an email at 9, uh, nine or 11 I'm p.m., expecting a reply. the yeah. concern yeah. is that that Cultural. sets a tone for the team and the team yeah. suddenly feel anxious that that might be the same yeah. expectation yeah. of them. You know, there's lots now of training programmes out there for line managers. It's become sort of trendy. Mm. But with goodness knows what standards they're all at and what they're all doing. I mean, there are just a lot of them. And, and I, th I think that is an issue. From my perspective, employers, having spoken to a, a lot of smaller organisations, they're saying we're looking for an authoritative voice. We'd like to know how we make our way through this maze of advice on mental health, well-being, etc. Who can we trust that might give us some simple advice on what good looks like and, and where to start? At the moment, if an employer wants to do something, they'll probably go to Google. Um, I mean, I'm serious, most employees, they will actually go to Google uh, to find out what it is, or perhaps something in the trade journal, and so on. Um, we need some kind of evidence-based, uh, authoritative approach to employers, what they can actually do, and why they should be doing it. It's not just about training, it's about the support network that you need to create, and if you could broaden that to yeah. well-being. Because even in the service sector, say the finance sector, although they're not major safety issues in that sense, psychological safety. Mm -hmm. We're talking, you really have a, a potential for broadening what you offer. It's not just construction sites. People's psychological health is at risk. Mm -hmm.